Well, good evening. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to our Angler Program celebration. This is a time where we're bringing together parents, students, faculty, board members, and Paul Angler himself. We're all together here in one, one location on a night where we can all grow as individuals and also grow together as the Angler Program. It's my, it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce to you the Angler Officer team that helped put all this together. Starting off, we have Haley Harthorn, the club president, Larissa Walk, club treasurer, Dylan Tegemeyer, club historian, and JC Panel, club secretary. <laughs> I'd like to next introduce to you the director of the Angler program, Tom Field. We have advisor Dave Lamb and program support specialist Michelle Basford. We also have tonight joining us, Director of the Rural Futures Conference, Chuck Schroeder. Chuck, are you here? Chuck? <laughs> we also have Dean Steve Waller and Vice Chancellor Ronnie Green. <laughs> I also saw in the seats tonight, uh, Senator Mark Christensen for District 44. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we're also fortunate to have some of our Angler Advisory Board members here. Tonight we have Ken Green. Ken's, Ken's in the back. We have Dave Stock and his wife Sharon. And John Miller and his wife Pat. <laughs> Lastly, it is my great honor to introduce to you tonight our founder, our Advisory Board Chairman, and our believer, Paul Angler. Angler is more than a program, more than a minor, more than a club. It's spitballing an idea over coffee at 3 a.m., the dawning of a solution lying in bed. It's unknowingly creating partnerships with your friends, the thrill of realizing these people are wired just like you. It's taking an opportunity and making it your destiny. It's a child's wandering mind in math class, an old man with a skip in his step. This is Angler. It's the fire in your belly. So what makes us different? Our program is not a program of prerequisites or th and theory, but one born of dreams and vision, and sweat and tears and the pursuit of excellence. We are a band of brothers and sisters who can't imagine living our lives in pursuit of someone else's dream. The Angler experience is a lifestyle and community, and it's definitely not for everyone. Here are a few things our program has accomplished over the last year, the last year that we feel are very important for us to share. We sponsored competitions for students to pitch their business idea and plans to a panel of judges. This gives a chance for the students to step out of the classroom and really bring their ideas to reality with outside feedback. We've also toured successful entrepreneurship businesses in the real world and have invited entrepreneurs in to speak to us. Tonight caps off the fourth Engler lecture. Something new this year was the Engler Learning Community, which was an opportunity for freshmen to work in groups to learn how to solve real big world problems. Sometimes they have the best outlook on problems by encompassing their local communities. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this picture kind of says it all. It's living the American dream. I, I really like it. Um, it it's, it's been said that it's not popular. It, I mean, it's not popular, but we believe it's up to us to build our own future. And when we're struggling and need the extra push, we oftentimes remember that 14-year-old boy who went out and bought, bought 100, head of 100 head of calves by himself without a penny to his name. He ended up succeeding in his adventures, followed by a lifetime of hard work that would eventually, eventually lead to the creation of a great cattle feeding company today. Paul Angler has proved to live the American dream and has proved that free enterprise truly works in our world today. We aspire to that moment in time when a boy found his love in life and gave it his all in pursuit of it. Here in the Angler program, guys, we're all about building the American dream. 
and when we realized the importance of free, free enterprise in our economy. We are here to celebrate both success and failure. There are no bad ideas, sometimes just better ones. Our program has a unique understanding and appreciation for agriculture and sees the potential and possibilities for innovation that can transform the resources and talent in agriculture into solutions, opportunities, and success. People want to be a part of something larger than themselves. They want to be a part of something that they're really proud of, that they can fight for and sacrifice for, trust. Entrepreneurs are not takers, we are makers. We are builders of America's tomorrow. We're here to create moments in time, and that's why I'm here, that's why everyone else is here tonight, because we are proud to be the brand of Engler, the Engler Entrepreneurship Program. Here are a few pictures of some, some of our students right here in action, getting their hands dirty. They have a passion for what they do, and they know if they're dedicated to the work, the success will come. Moms and dads, there's times when you, we all know there's times when you all wonder what exactly we're doing and what's exactly going through our head. I know my dad's sitting out there right now thinking he can contest right to that. But I know it always doesn't look like it's not making sense, but we are all working together to build a dream and it is not always a linear path. We're here in the Angler program not only to create connections and learn from the best, but learn how to fail. Fail fast, fail forward, and fail cheap. So last May, we had the opportunity to travel to Amarillo, Texas. Along the way, we made several stops to visit some business owners and tour their operations. Our final destination was Cactus Feeders, the world's largest privately owned cattle feeding operation. We had the privilege to eat a nice supper in Paul's backyard, and then we had a personal tour of the cattle feeder feed yard. The four-day tour was more than just visiting with successful business owners. It was a time to build relationships, create a vision, and establish goals. One student said that the bonding and brainstorming for hours on the bus was one of the most valuable things that they experienced on the trip. Ben Stein once said, personal relationships are the fertile soil from which all advancement, all success, and all achievement in real life grow. Our trip, to, our trip to Texas provided an opportunity for students to witness firsthand the success of the individuals who have invested in our future and prove that dedication to your ideas can bring success. One student quoted, entrepreneurship challenged me to think in ways I've never thought were possible. I've been exposed to many business models and learned from real world success stories, but also failures. The Engler program has taught me how to take those failures and turn them into opportunities. The Engler program is all about what we're doing. We are a unique program across the university and across the nation, and we strive to provide a challenging yet creative environment in which all students are encouraged to think differently and discover their unique talents, developing their ideas and pushing themselves to things that have never been done before. Before we move forward, I would just like to take a moment to recognize a very important person that our program has lost. Robin Laposotis has served on the Engler program board since its conception. She left a legacy with our program, her community, and the beef industry in Nebraska. Her grit, determination, and ability to connect with people were unmatched qualities. Robin was an inspiration particularly to me and other women entrepreneurs. Ro Robin has forever branded a place with us and could never be replaced. Please join me in taking a moment of silence to reflect on Robin's life. Thank you. As we look down this winding road, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but there's also a lot of opportunities that come with that. To build a truly world-class program, we have a lot of work to do, and part of this next year's efforts are gonna be working to create the Angler 2020 vision. And this is just to solidify our commitment to starting enterprises and to build an even stronger relationship with leading entrepreneurs.
We could discuss for hours the incredible experience we've had in our program surrounding ourselves with like-minded individuals, but to get to the best image of what we're all about, we have a video highlighting some of the, um, our vision for us students. We all have a story to write and a legacy to build, and this is something that we've accomplished um, and worked on in this past year, so hopefully you can see a little bit more from other students besides us in the program. America can get its economic engine moving again when less people start taking a paycheck and more people start taking a chance. The American dream lives on and this is mine. Revitalized Rural America makes for a stronger American economy. With small businesses being the backbone of America, I believe we can dig ourselves out of an economic crisis. The Angler Program provides me with the tools, leadership, and mentors to take on my American dream. It's because of this program that I'm not afraid to take on the world and go out and make an impact in my community, in my state, and my country. This is innovative and it's new, it's exciting. And as Engler students, we're going to class to build our future. Like we are getting out of it what we want out of it, not what professors are telling us we need to know. We are entrepreneurs, thinkers, doers, innovators. We dream big and have big ideas. We believe in hard work, dedication, and acceptance of risk in pursuit of our passion. We know that we miss 100% of the shots we don't take. We have the tenacity to excel by preparing when no one is watching. Where others retreat, we build. Where others wither, we endure and thrive. Where others stand still, we move forward. I tell you what, I walk out of that classroom every day that I have class feeling like I own the world. There's so many elite kids that have so much motivation, dedication to do what they want. We together could change the world through in large towns, in small towns, kids are going to go back and start businesses in small towns and just change the atmosphere of that area. And people are going to be CEOs of huge companies in big towns and make huge decisions for our world. We know that through our circle of relationships, we will create partnerships that generate the privilege of a brighter tomorrow. Together, we turn our passion into ideas and our ideas into reality. Once I joined the Engler program, it gave me motivation to put my passion to use and create a jewelry stand holder. I noticed there was a lack in jewelry stand holders that had the country feel to them, so I decided to design and construct mine own. I run a business which restores tractors, salvages tractors, rebuilds tractors. Operating a business has gotten way more difficult than it used to be. I feel that this Angler program is going to get me in the position that I need to be in to run a successful business. My idea is to own a restaurant that is all Nebraska products and also have cooking classes to show consumers that they can do what we do in a restaurant setting at their own home. We are passionate about agriculture's promise for the future. We are inspired by those who have gone before us and have made it possible for us to cultivate our American dream. Free enterprise and, uh, and entrepreneurship uh, uh, are absolutely uh, essential. It's not easy, okay? And when you run against something that's, that's difficult, you know, do, it takes a lot of perseverance. I think to, to build a reputation of, of integrity and honesty, and also have a little humility as you go along, that's very important. This program is equipping students to be able to be successful entrepreneurs uh, for the future. There is an excellent staff and support system available through the Engler program that not only is helping students professionally, but um, also just through this time in our lives as, as we're really trying to build our network, build um, who we are, and most importantly, where we want to be. We know that it is up to us to create enterprise, and in doing so, strengthen our families, communities, and nation. We are visionaries. 
think past the appearance of it now and think about what it's going to hold on the inside mm -hmm. and how we can change everything about it. We are Angler students. We are Nebraska. We are the future. Join us. So folks, thank you so much for being here tonight. Parents, I hope this gives you a glimpse into maybe what Angler is and what Angler, what it means to be an Angler entrepreneur here at UNL. Um, Cause there's, there's a lot of confusion with communication, communication from students to parents. And uh, thank you for making the trip here. And students, I hope in five years, you can say that this is a completely different program cause it's on even more of a advanced level and to see it grow in just the four years it's been here has been um, absolutely amazing, but I'd just like to close out our program with a final statement of who we are and what our outcome and what we want that to be. Um, we hope to be an exhilarating environment of challenge, creativity, and collaboration that fosters new perspectives, celebrates innovative thinking, encourages personal discovery, and changes the way students think about themselves and the world around them. In this way, we prepare students to bring an entrepreneurial spirit in, to their workplace regardless of where their career paths lead them. Seniors, this is for you. You might be working in corporate America right out of college or somewhere else, but we hope that in 10 years, 15 years, you have the tools, the network, and the skills to take on your American dream and to pursue free enterprise in America. So let's just thank all the seniors here and also everyone who's made the trip to be here tonight. I would now like to introduce to you our lecturer for the evening. Jason Tadkey has been a driving force behind many leading internet ag tech companies over the last 15 years. Jason's previous venture was a startup he began in his basement and recently sold to DuPont Pioneer called Farm Technology LLC. Jason's current venture, Farm Mobile LLC, is his third startup in the agricultural technology space. This company focuses on the passive data collection from farm equipment, regardless of equipment manufacturer, utilizing the new ISOBUS standards. This data will use M2M technology to automatically populate an electronic farm record that will allow the farmer to have easy access to their data on the farmer's device of choice. Farmer focus has always been a vital part of his company's achievements, and success in Farm Mobile will be no different. Please help me in welcoming Jason Tadke. Hello. All right. Well, thank you for having me here. I got to tell you that, you know, being an entrepreneur, you never really know what you're going to get. And I can tell you that I did not anticipate sitting with Paul Engler, hearing about him crash a helicopter during dinner, all right? <laughs> That's one of those really cool things that you don't really realize is, is it's a legend, it's a story, it's, it's really cool. And I appreciate being here and you having me. So I'm gonna start out by, I'm not just gonna do a pitch for my company because that's the easy thing to do and that's what I know how to do really good. So I'm gonna try to give you guys some of the lessons that I've learned, um, some of the lessons that I've learned as I've gone through here. So I'm gonna go back and tell you about where I started. Uh, I started as a commodity trader at the Pillsbury Company. Um, I worked there for six years. I went through, thank you. I went through, um, started in Minneapolis. I was, I was working, well, I'm, I'm gonna go back a little bit further. So my parents were uh, both raised on dairy farms in southern Minnesota. So they were the runts of the litter, so they moved to the city. And this was a time when my grandfather constantly, we would have dinner, right, at, at noon, it's dinner um, on the farm. And I would just enjoy hearing all these conversations, right? And relatives would come from all over the place whenever grandma cooked. And my grandfathers, both of them, was kind of a replay day after day, one at one side of the family, one at the other side of the family, but they always complained about the price of grain, right? And how the farmers took the biggest risk in this whole thing, but they're the ones that usually ended up with the smallest piece. And my grandfather always told me that you wanted to work for the elevator because they were the ones that made all the money, okay? And when you hear this long enough, you kind of start to believe it. And then he said, or those guys in Chicago who don't even know what the commodity looks like, right? Those guys make all the money. So growing up, I, I, I tend to believe that since grandpa said it for so long, it's gotta be true. 
Um, I went to college and decided I wanted to work with farmers. I wanted to work in the commodities markets. I got a professor who helped. Um, he didn't know anything about commodities, but he said he was an economics professor. And he said, I'll learn it with you. And we ordered books from the Chicago Board of Trade. And we went through the class together for a year. And we started playing little simulations and games with each other. Um, and it was something that really caught my attention. So I got this job with Pillsbury Auto School. And I start, I'm living at home, and life is really good. I've got my first real job, and I'm living at home. Mom and dad aren't complaining about me being there yet. And I get this, uh, I get this, I get this meeting with the, the, my boss, and he says, there's a really good opportunity for you in Kansas City. And I said, well, thank you, but I'm not interested, because I don't want to leave my family and my friends, and this is home to me. And I went home, and I sat down at my parents' place for dinner. And I told my parents about my day, and my dad looked at me, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, they usually don't ask twice, right? You don't have much here holding you back. This is the time in your life when you can go do something like that, and you really should think about it. So the next day, I went back and said, you know what, I'll try it. So what this, uh, and I ended up going to Kansas City and loved it. Fell in love with the guys I was working with. I learned a ton about trading by a bunch of smart people. And it led to another opportunity in Memphis where I started trading cotton seed, which led to another opportunity for me to start a company called Farms.com. I was the third employee there. Um, it was young. Uh, it was an internet startup company. We ended up raising like $40 million and didn't really have a plan. Um, it was the easiest money I had ever raised. I never raised money before in my life. And I've tried to do it for two other companies since, and it's been a lot more difficult than it was back then. But, but that, that company was a, was a dot-com boom bust. Um, so then I went back to trade, and I traded with the Schooler Company for a couple years. And I figured out that technology, technology hadn't caught up to the traditional business. And I understood trading pretty well when we were using phones. And I understood that I didn't want to be sitting in that chair using phones for the next 20 years, because I didn't think the phones were going to be around. Now, most of my peers thought differently, right? They thought the phone is something that's never going away. It's something that has to work, because it is, it's how we've always done it. So I was able to get a couple um, patents around a system that uh, automatically hedged grain, allowed farmers to go online and make offers for their grain, and we would automatically sell it for them whenever the prices matched. And that went pretty well for about, for about from 2003, I started to about 2008. And then I made this big bet on this thing called the Blackberry. You guys remember those? Okay. So I made this big bet on this thing called the Blackberry, and I said, you know what, farmers are gonna wanna be able to sell grain from these BlackBerry phones. So spent a bunch of money, and it was really hard to build this app. And we finally got the app built. And if you were on the Verizon network with the exact same phone as the Altel network, it wouldn't work on both phones. Okay? So at the beginning, before the iPhone, we had all these different systems out there for trading grain online. But I just knew that if we could figure out a way for a farmer to have that in his hand and trade it, it would work. Well, then the iPhone came along. And the iPhone standardized the process, so it allowed us to build much faster and that market adaption picked up greatly. And we went from 5,000 customers to 15,000 customers in about three years. And those are farmers who never used the computer. They skipped it because they had in their pocket the ability to market their grain. So that's kind of the story of farms technology, which led to, I sold that to DuPont in February of last year. I had certain restrictions where I can't trade and do things like that until uh, for a year, so those have recently um, ended and I've started a new company. And the new company is called Farm Mobile. And I have a real product, so I have to pass it around. So anybody who wants to see it can actually see it. But what this does is it's, a, it's almost like a tracking device. And this is how the box will come. So when you think of selling to farmers, you've got to think of something really easy. It's got to be simple or they're not going to pay any attention to it, right? For example, I know nobody in this audience is probably guilty of this, but my father came down to see me and my wife and kids a few weeks ago, and he took some pictures, and he handed me his camera, his digital camera. For you younger people, before you had phones that took pictures, we had these things called digital cameras on them, okay, and they kept, they kept memory sticks. So he handed me his memory stick, and I put it in the computer, and he had 2,200 pictures on his memory stick, right? And I'm like, Dad, why, do you have, why haven't you backed them up on your computer? And he said, it's too confusing. I said, Dad, I've got, I've got the post-it notes on the side of your screen telling you exactly how to do it. <laughs> and he still said, it's too confusing. He said, I'll just buy a new memory stick. They're cheap. 
So that's his backup plan, I guess. <laughs> that same problem exists in all of our farm equipment today. We've got really expensive systems in there that can track anything in the world you want to track. But most people have no idea how to get the information out, unless you work for one of the big companies that really want the data. They've got it figured out. So what we're doing is we're selling this unit. Right now, I'm giving it away for the first um, 100 beta test farms this year. But you plug that thing into a tractor, and you drive. And it automatically grabs the data, and it pumps it up to what we call as an electronic farm record. And in that electronic farm record, we can store your data. And if people want to buy it, they can come to you and ask to purchase your data. And our goal is to share half of whatever we make off that data with the farmer. So if any of you read the Wall Street Journal yesterday, there was a big article about data and who owns the data, and is it Pioneer, is it Monsanto, is it John Deere? Um, that's, that's really the sweet spot that we identified about a year ago, and we're really trying to, to aggressively hit right now. So that's kind of my background, and now I'll get into the real meat of the presentation. So here are my lessons learned along the way. You're going to need a really big survival knife, right? Because you have no idea what's coming your way. And there's no way you can even prepare for what might be lying ahead. So there's three things that I've put together after I've done this a few times. And I by no means believe I'm an expert at all. I'm just trying to give you some advice as to things that have helped me. One of the big ones is, is teamwork. OK, that's what I have here in the middle. You got to find the right people to be on your team. It's all about people. No matter what we sell, it's all about people. And the people on your team are a representation of you and your product. And everything that you do is all about the people. Up on the right there, the battery. You got to make something that matters to you. Because passion will be your fuel when you can't go forward. OK, there's going to be roadblocks that you're like, I have no idea how to get over these roadblocks. How, how, whatever comes your, whatever you can imagine or can't imagine, it'll come your way. So really, in those times, you really need to be doing something you love, because that's when most people decide to jump off. Last one down there is a network. And it took me, you guys have this figured out. I just heard, I just watched the video, and I've heard today, you guys have got this figured out, and you're way ahead of the game. Because it took me until I was like 36 to figure out what networking really meant. So I'll get into some of that, but you guys are way ahead of the game. So teamwork, right? Work with good people who share your vision and are awesome communicators. That's probably the biggest thing, right? You got to be able to communicate. And for me, it doesn't matter if it's, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys who can be different at work than I am at home. And I think most entrepreneurs are that way. You're just always, you're always you. And I think some people have a corporate life and then they come home and they're this person. But you got to find these ways to communicate, no matter if it's home or if it's at work or whatever. My wife will tell you, my favorite saying, and I'll get to this in a second, is manage my expectations. Okay? It drives her nuts, but if I call her and say, honey, I'm going to be home at 7.30 tonight because I'm running late, she might go, oh, right? But at least she knows I'm going to be home at 7.30. If I don't call her, guess what? When I get home at 7.30, guess what happens? Where have you been, right? So those things are the things that most people, it's common sense. And that's what really makes your team good, is to be able to manage those expectations. Hire the best people you can possibly afford and give them upside. Because then you are all invested in a common vision. And it really, really makes the tough times easier. Manage expectations, right? We just talked about this. I've got a guy that used to work for me who would say, oh, I'm just going to run, grab lunch. I'll be back in 30 minutes. OK. I'm not a drill sergeant at all. I create the most open environment you could possibly have to work. But he would come back an hour and a half later. And be, you know what? That's fine, but next time just tell me you're going to be gone for an hour and a half. I don't care. But when you say you're going to be gone for 30 minutes, for an hour and a half, kind of just a little one of those little things. So managing expectations. With your customers, when something goes wrong, when, what you guys are doing, when you're starting your own business, there's going to be problems all of the time. And you've got to own them quickly, and you've got to manage your customers' expectations, and you can't overpromise. Because whenever you overpromise, you set yourself up for failure. And it's really, really, really easy to overpromise when you're just starting. Share ideas, OK? Ideas are, are, everybody thinks, oh, I've got this great idea. But then they try to like, hold on to it, because they don't want anybody else to steal your ideas. Um, Brad, Feld, Brad Feld has a book out. He's a, he's a writer and a guy that I got to have lunch with once. And he said, 
you know what, there is no market for ideas. You can't Google ideas and buy one. You can't go to eBay and buy an idea. The idea is something, and it's important, but the ability to execute that idea is really what counts. So, so having ideas and sharing them with others is the easiest way to get other people communicating back to you. And you guys were just talking about this very thing in your program, right? Once you share the idea, you get some people from different walks of life looking at the problem a little bit different. And it totally works. And an open culture, so if you don't have an open culture, you can't share your ideas and you can't be able to take the criticism. And that's, that's another one that works really, really well. And this is probably the most important. Um, a reputation takes forever to build, and it takes a few seconds to get rid of. And it's about doing the things when nobody's around that are the right things. And that, when you're starting out, is extraordinarily important. That's how you're in trust of your, of your customers. And execution makes magic, okay? Build it well and build it quickly. I heard, I heard you guys say over here, there's one thing that I disagree with, okay? You said, like, build it well, build it quickly, and build it cheap. Well, the build it cheap one usually doesn't happen when you're first building it out there, right? If you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail fast, but, but re realize that most of the time it takes probably two or three times the money that your most conservative estimates are, uh, our projections have for you. At least that's what it has been for me. But once you make execution, once you set that, that point in the sand that you need to get to, and everybody in your team starts working towards it, and once you get there, then you set it up again. And it's about this common vision and this being able to get to this point and your team really comes together when you hit deadlines. Okay, when you, when you nail something and you pull all-nighters and you get this thing done, we're doing that right now. We need to be ready for planning season. And thank goodness it's staying cold because that's helping me a little bit on our other business. But, you know, this is one of the first times I think I'm hoping for a late, a late planning uh, just to make sure that we have got everything ready to go. But once you hit that, once you hit that point, your team just bonds in ways that you wouldn't believe. And then the next goal seems to get a little bit, little bit easier. Everyone's kind of getting some confidence that they know they can do it. And then the execution really takes off. Okay, make meaning. So this is one that I got from a guy called, named Gao, Guy Kawasaki. He was one of the first Apple Macintosh engineers. And you can Google his talks, and he does this one all the time. Um, I, got, I got to meet him one day. And he was talking about, I uh, varied a little bit on this, but he was talking about people get into entrepreneurship a lot of times to make money instead of making meaning, right? They're tired of making money for a bunch of other people, so they just want to hop in and make money. And he said, when you make meaning, meaning, is, meaning gets you through. Meaning is the thing that helps you solve the problems. And when you make meaning, you normally lead to making money. But when you try to go in it looking to make money, you normally don't make meaning or make money. So in his companies that he invests in, it's gotta have a cause that the entrepreneur is totally passionate about. And that's true in just about anything. It's so much easier to believe, and it's so much easier for you as an entrepreneur to get money when you fully believe and are committed in your position and what you're doing. All right, how do you make meaning? One way is to change the quality of life of your customers. Make their lives easier. We did this at Farms Technology by, by creating an app on the phone where farmers could sell their grain. And for the first time, I was talking to one of the early users of our product, previous product, because I'm trying to get him to use the new one. And he said, Jason, I could never figure out how you made any money only charging us a penny a bushel on this, on this app that you had. And I said, well, he said, there's no way I thought you were going to stay in business, let alone sell it to DuPont. I said, well, here's what you didn't know. If you're looking at business the traditional way, a traditional broker who uses phones, and has a lot of labor and makes a lot of mistakes, you gotta charge more. Computers are really, really good at doing the same process over and over and over and over and doing it cheap. So we were very passionate about being able to make their lives easier using the phone. And once you do that and people aren't complaining about your price, that means you've created value. And value is really, really good. It's a good place to be when people aren't complaining about your price. Right or wrong, fix an abuse, find an abuse, okay? Is there something that's going on out there that you know is wrong? This helps you make meaning as well, right? Are they doing something wrong? The fact that farmers aren't getting paid for their data right now, kinda, kinda ticks me off a little bit, right? There's value there. We need to figure out a way to get them paid for it. Provide meaningful value. So this is no price, no price complaints equals value. Okay, and a lot of times, if you have no price complaints, if you try to raise your price, 
it's not a bad thing because you're going to kind of try to figure out where that supply and demand line should be. But those are the three ways that you can, that I think that you can make meaning. And this is probably the most important one that I've learned is the network. And you were talking about this earlier, but for years I sat in my desk and I traded and I worked on my business and I didn't really care to network with anyone because I thought that I know my business better than anybody else and what else could people possibly help me with, right? They don't know exactly what I'm doing. They don't get it. They don't understand. And I got involved with an entrepreneurs group in Kansas City called Pipeline. And this basically paired me with a bunch of different entrepreneurs, very similar to what you guys are doing, except the next version, I'd say. Um, and I realized that business is really business. The same problems happen for me, I mean, that were happening for the other people, and vice versa. And we all had different ways to come at this and, and really start attacking these problems in a, in a group effort. And wow, does that make your life easier? When you, can, when you can lean on someone else who's been there before or done that or has a few ideas, it really changes the game. So again, back to this, Brad Feld again, that, that technology author, he, I, he taught me about networking and he said, this is all you need to know about networking, because nobody explained to me what networking was. Okay, I didn't really understand it. I, you go around and shake people's hands. I didn't, really, I didn't really get it. And he said, networking is this, it's nodes on a network. So some of you might know what that is and some of you might not, but I'm gonna tell you. Think of the internet as a network and think of any IP address, which means anything you can touch the internet with as a node, okay? Throughout your life, you're gonna create all of these connections and you don't even realize that you're creating them, but the fact that you're, you're involved in agriculture means that you've got this huge network of people, neighbors, friends, that you don't even realize who remember you, okay? They remember your work ethic, they remember that you know how to look them in the eye, they remember you know how to shake hands, they remember you do what you say, and that stuff becomes really, really powerful and you can truly leverage that. So, in school, you start making these relationships, okay? Some of them fade over time and some of them stay there, but they're all connected to this network. And in college, you make some. And you keep making all of these different connections. For me, it was all my previous jobs. And you don't make people angry, right? You do what you say, you be a decent person, and all of these things start to come back to you. Neighbors, through churches, and then through organizations. And all of a sudden, your network starts to go over here, and it starts to go over here, and this guy knows this guy, and they'll help you with this, and they'll help you with this, and all these things start to come together. And that's what's really cool about the power of networking, <laughs> these nodes on a network. Um, this, this group that I'm involved with has really taken it to that, to that next level, and they've, it's, uh, any of you who are starting a business, after you get going a little bit, apply to this thing called Pipeline, because it's here in Nebraska now, and it is, it is really, really extraordinary. And that's exactly what we're doing here today, right? We're building a network. We're talking to people. We're letting people share ideas. We're learning from each other. So those are kind of the lessons that I've learned through doing all this. I hope this was, I hope this was helpful. I'm happy to answer a ton of questions because I'm really not good at just talking. I'm more of a conversationalist. Um, if anybody has any, I'd be happy to, to talk about Anyone? I'll be around afterwards. Yes, sir. Uh, from your perspective, as uh, with a history in brokerage, mm -hmm. do you think the trend will change as far as, because the, the benefit of, of picking up the phone is that you get feedback from your broker who's sitting sure. there studying the trends in the market and whatnot. Sure. Whereas if you don't have that, then it's more on the farmer to pick up that knowledge on his own. Where do you see the trend of that going? Yeah, I think there's going to be some of, I mean, old habits die hard. The phone isn't going away anytime soon. Um, I think what we learned from my previous company was that if you've got offers in the market working for you, suddenly your buyer isn't an adversary anymore. You're not like trying to, you know, get an extra penny or two out of them. Suddenly the conversations change where it's, hey, what do you think about the markets? I'm about four cents away. Should I just take it or do you think we can hang in there? So it really changed the dynamics a lot of the conversations that happen. But there's going to be people, the, the phone is by far the dominant way. It's probably, you know, 90% of the grain still trades on the phone, which was the massive opportunity um, to, to keep converting that slowly but surely. But yeah, the old habits, they're never going to go away. It's just the, the product mix starts to change. And as a business standpoint, are farmers, as a general trend, are they more ambitious to make their own decisions or are they hesitant and still want 
Uh, you can't put farmers into one or the other camp. I mean, that's just really hard. There's the, you, for everything you say is, is black, someone's going to say it's white. And you, you've got, I mean, you've got them all over the board. But, I mean, the key is if they find what you're doing to be valuable, they come back. And nobody sells to farmers better than other farmers. Right? I mean, that's the way all of this stuff really gets started and gets going is you do a good job with a few people and they tell a few other people. If you look at any of the commercials on television, they always show a farmer standing in a field usually, right, talking about what he's doing and they have his name usually right on there so everybody knows. I mean, that formula, is, it works. So, yes? In regard to your, in regard to your new product, yes. um, can you tell us a little bit like what the end goal is with it and how big is the market and opportunity with it? Coming from a fellow Pipeline Innovator of the Year back there, a planted question, he's drilling me already. Um, <laughs> thank you, Paul. Um, I, I, the opportunity, I think, is one of those things. This information touches like a $7 billion industry in the US. And the more we communicate what we're doing, the more we find new uses for the data, things I wouldn't have thought of on my own. For example, we have some agronomists coming to us and saying, I haven't gotten you know, Paul's, Paul's business in a long time, and he's working with this other agronomist, but I'd really like to know what he's doing because I might do it a little bit different. And what I learned there is agronomy is kind of like an accountant, right? Um, you, don't, you don't give your tax documents to a bunch of different people and have them compete over to who's got the best one, right? But, but having access to the same data set like that would allow a, 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 someone who's prospecting your business to say, would you pay me $2,000 if I got to look at your old history to, make, to try to make my business proposal look better than what you have? And then that's totally your call if you want to do it or not. How big could it get? I, I, really, don't, I really don't know in terms of dollars, but I know that there are, our way of collecting data right now on, uh, from the USDA is archaic and it hasn't changed in 30 years. So there, there's, a, there's a much better way to do it. And if it takes plugging something into a tractor and leaving it alone and driving away, I think, I think that's going start to start to build value as we collect more and more of the data. The more data you get, the more valuable it's going to be, the more we're going to pay the farmers. Anything else? Jason, could you maybe touch on uh, what you told the students today in the meeting about how you manage people and kind of the workspace that you create for sure. your employees? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I create a totally open environment. As of as this company right now, well, I'll tell you about the previous one first. The previous one, we had uh, developers who are computer program guys, right? And, and managing those guys is like managing artists. It's just, it's just really difficult to do, right? Um, you, you give them a project, you let them get their work done, they come in at goofy hours. Um, they don't talk to people normally. Um, they're good guys. They just sit in their rooms with their headsets on and pound out code. So what I decided to do is put a kitchen in, the, in between. We've got offices for developers, and we've got a kitchen. And we put a ping pong table right there. And I made my operations people, basically, every day they had to play a game of ping pong with a developer. Okay? So at first, everyone's like, oh. And then by the end, I had to tell them to stop playing some ping pong because they started, you know, <laughs> they started really getting it. But when you have those, when you, put in, when you put those environments in place where people can start to bounce ideas, those guys would have never talked to each other had we not had something else for them to do. And once they start talking to each other, suddenly now these ideas are coming back and forth and they're figuring out new ways to solve problems on their own. And I'm doing nothing. I mean, these guys are solving all these problems by themselves. And that's a really cool feeling when you can create that kind of space and that kind of environment. Right now, I've got a guy here in Lincoln who works for me. Um, I, I work, I'm in Kansas City. We're always meeting it somewhere, some meeting somewhere. We don't have defined space yet. We don't think we need it quite yet. But we're always, every week, we're getting together and we're having those collisions where we can all just kind of brain dump with each other. So I, I, think, I think workspace is a huge deal. Whenever you can, stuff still happens by the water cooler. I mean, everybody makes a joke about it, but the water cooler actually works because people bump into each other and minds start to talk about real things. Yes, sir. Entrepreneur with capital. How did you get your capital into how do you, how do you teach these people yes. to get capital? Awesome question, because I've screwed this one up twice. Um, when you're an entrepreneur and you're starting out, you've got two decisions. And it's really, I used to make this so much more complicated, but you have two decisions. I can either sell more product to fuel my growth, more sales, 
or I have to sell a piece of my company to help fuel my sales. So it's really this thing. I will tell you that what you have to be careful of is that equity in that company, both of mine, um, first one, there was nothing there, but the second one, by the time I exited, I had a really, really small piece because I borrowed a lot of money along the way. So in the beginning, I probably gave up too much equity at certain times when I probably should have just hunkered down a little more. You know, the mortgage is the mortgage and the line of credit is the line of credit and openly communicate with your wife except for on that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that, you, you, have to, you have to be selling something to get people to really want to give you anything. So that means you got to prototype and you got to go quick and I, I think it really comes down to getting something out there and listening to what your customers say. A lot of times your customers will help fund you if they really like your product. But, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a challenging one for all of these guys, and it takes money to do it. I haven't had a paycheck in, a, in over a year, but I'm paying other people, right? So, so you dig as far as you want to dig, and when you're uncomfortable with the risk, then you have to sell a piece of your company to help, to help the growth. But be really careful, because that early equity, when you, need, when you think you need the money the most, you're going to need more money some other time, and you're going to have to give up some of your company again. So that's, that's, a, great, that's a great question. Jason, um Two quick questions. How hard was it to sell the company that you had worked so hard to build with people I think you cared a lot about? Yeah, it was, it was, it was one of the, I don't think I've ever been depressed in my life before, but the second when they wrote that check and said, see ya, it was like, really? <laughs> this is kind of mine. Uh, kind of wasn't mine anymore. Um, that was hard. That was really hard because I'd worked 10 or 11 years on it. And I think after you sell your first one, and I've heard this from a bunch of other mentors and entrepreneurs that, that I've known that have given me advice, they said, you know what, after you sell your first one, you realize it's not your baby. You're building something of value to give to someone else because then you can go on and do it again. So I think after, after I started a new one again, then it kind of gets your mind off of not doing the old one. So, uh, but it, it was really difficult. And I think that's where you gotta make sure you have the employees taken care of when I said in there, give them a piece of the company up front let them work for it. So then no matter what happens, you still feel like they're going to get a, a fairly decent piece or a fairly different check for the hard work they put in before the new guys came. And then a follow-up question. How do you deal with and manage not only your own doubt early in the process, but also the doubt of the people around you and maybe people that in your family or whatever? How do you, how do you manage those two things, that that's inside you and that that's around you? I think people who decide to go and, and you really got to jump off the cliff, okay? You can't really be an entrepreneur and have a day job. It just, you, you got you to jump off and you got to go do it. And once you jump, decide to make that commitment to jump off and go do it, then you got to overcome the obstacles. You can't, everybody's telling you no, right? And you got to realize that you just didn't ask right, right? You got to refine your pitch because you believe so passionately in what you do. So it's a matter of, if they say no, they just weren't the right person. I mean, you can pitch to 20 different angel groups and 20 different VCs, and then the 21st one, you do nothing any different, but you just click with them. So it's a matter of just getting out there, using that network, finding more people, and communicating your idea, because sooner or later you're gonna find someone. I mean, it's like a marriage, right? I mean, you just gotta keep looking until you find the right person, I think. So that's one of those things. Um, there are times, though, when you go, whoa, how are we going to do this? And it seems like whenever you get right to those times, something kind of breaks. You, you realize that I'm in trouble now, and I need, to, I need to figure out a way to get over this, so I've got to try something different. So then you try something totally different on the same people, and a lot of times you'll be surprised at how many times you, get, you think you're almost dead here, and then you try this something different, and that leads to a whole other another place or another revenue stream. So I think it's a matter of just being flexible because you have no idea, that survival kit, that knife at the beginning, I mean, that's, you don't know what's coming, but you've got to figure out a way to get around it. So I've, got, I've been very fortunate, and they haven't all worked. You know, sometimes you've got to pull the plug, too. But when you're young, it's the best time to do that. It's, it, it's easy when you don't have multiple mouths to feed. The risk goes uh, much higher as you get a little bit older, but the average age to start your own company right now is like 39 years old. Everybody thinks of the average entrepreneur as, you know, the kid out of school who quit school because he was making too much money selling whatever online. And that, that, that really doesn't happen. 
You know, it takes a while. It takes domain expertise to really, to really make an impact and change an industry. Any other ones? Well, I, I truly appreciate being here. Thank you, Paul, very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tom. I, I, uh, I was amazed in the program, and you guys really opened my eyes. So, thank you. Jason, thank you so much. We have a small gift for just thank you for spending the day with us, and I know you're spending the day with us tomorrow too. So excellent. I look forward to it. Yes. This is always this is always good. Now I got to go home and return emails probably for the next three or four hours, but that's okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's fun to get out of the realm once in a while when you can when you can change it up. It really I get as much energy from you guys as you get from me. So that's that's the fun part about this. So thanks thank again, you. Jason. You're welcome. At this time, I'm going to call Paul up, and I think he has a few words to share. So, this will be the wind up. I told I told Jason when he walked by there. I said, I wonder after that presentation whether we got another young Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, you know, kind of running around loose. And uh, he said he he uh, he didn't hardly think so. But uh, uh, can you all hear me? You can't. Believe it or not, uh, Tom said I should uh, make a few words, remarks. He said, but for goodness sakes, Good. he said, for goodness sakes, make it brief. So I'll try to do that. However, I hadn't really prepared anything until I got into the uh, hotel about 1.30 this, this afternoon. And then, of course, I sat down and, and, uh, and wrote the Gettysburg Address. But, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm one of these guys that, that uh, irrespective of, of uh, being on the uh, uh, <coughs> on the circuit a good many times that you know I really don't you know uh, in, enjoy it really to be real honest with you so I always wait till the last minute to prepare any, anything and I, because I need the motivation of being you know the it's it's it's, just, it's the last train in town and it's it's fixing to leave so you better get, better get on the stick here but. I do have some remarks, and, and please bear with me because I think they are important, particularly from the standpoint of showing my appreciation. Uh, the, we, we're, we're here this evening for several things, but obviously the, the main thing was to congratulate these senior students. And uh, equally important is to acknowledge their parents. And I think it'd be an excellent idea right now for all the parents, irrespective of, of whether it was you had a young uh, boy or, or, uh, or a young lady or, or a young son, you know, in the program that wasn't on the program as a graduate, you know, but you still have someone that's in the program. I think a very good idea, you know, to have all the parents stand, if you would, please. Uh, you know, it reminds me a little bit about uh, the only experience I had. The uh, well, my father only had a fourth grade education. He was a great man. He really, he was a. You know, I didn't really realize how great a man he was till after he'd passed away. He passed away when he's still fairly, fairly young, and for, far as young as you know today. And uh, and but he was drum, drum, drum. You got to get a, an education, college education. So I, I was invited to give a commencement speech at, uh, at a graduation at West Texas A&M University, and, and I told those graduates at that time that, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're probably not going to remember me if someone, you know, later on in life asked, you know, who did the commencement speech? Because I said, there's no way that I remember, you know, who gave the commencement speech when I, when I graduated, so I don't remember that. But there was one thing that I very vividly remember and will continue to, rest of, to remember the rest of my life, and that is the look that my mother and father had on their faces 
than when I walked up there to get the diploma. So uh, the parents are extremely important kids. And when you stop to think of you know, all the sacrifices that probably most of them had to make you know, during the time that you were in school, and all kinds of very, probably some very serious sacrifices at different times, if it was anything like when I went to school. Backing up a little bit and setting up the Angler Entrepreneurship Program, uh, we were hopeful that, that our recruitment program, this was in the early phases of, of the program, would be successful in identifying and recruiting these young men and these young ladies who had that so-called spirit that we have referred to so many times and over and over tonight, you know, had that fire in their belly. Then the uh, <coughs> teaching job was to nurture, and I think nurture is, is a good word. I think it probably is as descriptive as any word I could come up with because what the job is that, 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 that uh, Dave and, and, uh, and Tom have is to nurture, you know, that, that spirit, you know, bring it along. And, and they, uh, and the, the, and to make it grow and, and, and have, have courses that would help and equip these students to, to go out into, into the business world after graduating. The, the uh, proper training and the teaching that they have had uh, found and, and, and maybe find, found and, and uh, start a business or go out and get a job, which is equally as important, but, I, but it gives them the, the tools and the talent to go out and be selective, you know, in getting a type of a job where they can capitalize on their entrepreneurial spirit as well as their training that they received here, you know, at the, at the university. <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> if we're successful in, in, in nurturing these, these young people and training and so on and so forth, the, uh, 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 I think that we will also make a, a giant contribution uh, to the uh, University of Nebraska. Oh, is Ronnie Green, did he sneak out on me? No, he did. We'll be sure and tell him what I said here. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and the reason I say that is that recently uh, the, uh, the Gallup organization, <coughs> in response to a growing criticism that is becoming more and more prevalent here in, in our country today, that there's a growing uh, uh, criticism that the nation's colleges and universities uh, are, uh, were uh, just granting more or less just granting college degrees instead of properly uh, preparing these students to go out into the business, to the business world. And you'll hear that more and more uh, criticism, particularly when some of these, these colleges and universities are going to the respective state legislatures and so forth and, and, uh, and, and uh, acquiring funds. So <coughs> the, uh, and so they're in more in the business of preparing the college degrees instead of really preparing these, these, uh, these young men and women. The Gallup found interesting, and I quote, they said a uh, <coughs> whopping 96% of the chief academic officers in these various universities throughout the United States, when they were asked at a, uh, uh, a, some, uh, a uh, you know, question, are you, you really think that you're preparing your students, your graduates, you know, to go out into this so-called uh, world of business. 96% of them said yes, okay? Very, very strong percentage. Satisfied with the fact that that's what they're really doing. Then when they turned around and, and took the polls nationwide of, of what, the, what the people really thought they were doing, there was only 14%. Only 14% of the population said, you know, that they were doing, you know, a good job in the preparation of their, of their, of their graduates. And then they did a further poll with the business leaders, you know, here in the United States, the selected group of business people. And it was only one out of every 10 of, of those business uh, leaders that said that they felt that the universities were doing a good job in preparing their graduates to go out into the business world. And uh, so uh, that obviously got my attention 
And then I couldn't help when I was reading that, that stuff that, that you know, I say, can't think, well, what about our program? What, what about the, uh, and I hate to use the, the word again because it's been used all night, angler, 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 <laughs> angler. <laughs> so I just refer to it as our program. And, and, and uh, so, but I think we've done a heck of a job here. We're in, a, in our third, fourth year of our, of our program here and man, Folks, we've come a long ways. We come a long ways, and he's going to hate me forever for saying this. But but when we got a guy like Tom, Mr. Tom or Dr. Tom Field sitting back there, you know, and the contributions that he's made, and the design of this program that he that he's done, I mean, you know, you, you can't thank him uh, enough, and uh, for me believing that. And actually, I think that uh, we we've, we've gained the recognition here, university wise, at least. It seems to me that that's what I've observed, what I've been told, you know, that the Ingram, whoops, I said it again. <laughs> our, our program is really the poster child, the poster child here in, in the university. So in closing, a lot of what I've been saying is just, is just rhetoric. Uh, the proof of how effective and how valuable lays in what these graduates, their predecessors and their successors, really going to get done in the challenge of going out into the into the into the business world and establishing themselves as true entrepreneurs uh, I want to thank you again uh, it, it's uh, Jason did an outstanding job but I tell you the, the ones that really got to my heart is when these young people got up initially and had their part of the program and I think that's just tremendous and I'm so cockeyed proud of you. I just want to, want to thank you and thank you. And thank you. And you, Mr. Pender. <laughs> I'll take that off. Okay. Yeah, I can't have it. Paul, is this on? Is it? Yeah. Paul, let me shake your hand again. We just want to say thank you so much. We wouldn't be here without you. And I hope you know that. You're really important to our program. I'm glad you can make it up and see us today. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yep. That sums up our evening. Uh, I'd just like to say once again, thank you for everyone for coming. We do have a dessert reception over here in the room next door. We have a special piano performance and just a time for everyone to network, talk to fellow parents, students, advisors. Uh, Paul will be around for a while. Um, so feel free to mingle around. Thank you. <laughs>